two to one. Let me make sure that I gathered up over here. Just setting it up for live right now. All right. No turning back now. No turning back now. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Just let me make sure. Ah, perfect. There we are. All right. So, uh, First of all, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Will Driscoll from the Virginia Sports Hall of Fame. I'm the executive director here. Uh, coming to you this morning from my office uh, here in town center of Virginia Beach. Uh, there's, don't worry, there's plenty of appropriate social distancing. I'm the only person here in the office and we're really trying to do our part to keep everything that way. Um, but before I introduce the other person you see on your video screen right now, I kind of want to give you a, a little bit of background as to what we're doing here. Uh, last summer, we rolled out our Hall Call podcast and the podcast has been a a great content platform for us. It's really been highlighting our inductees, but also topical figures and issues in Virginia sports. Uh, we did it in partnership with ESPN Radio 94.1 here locally, but due to the current crisis and the outbreak, uh, the, the studio is restricted and rightfully so, it should be. Um, so what we looked at was, you know, we have these 19 episodes of Hall Call, but we wanna keep this content stream going. So that's what you see here. And actually, you know, this is this is live. And I'll tell you right now, I just got a, a meeting notification that popped up. So to give you an idea that it is live. <laughs> but again, with everything going on, we wanted to keep that content stream going. And so today, in keeping with the mission of Hall Call, uh, we're joined by a, a pretty interesting figure, at least in my mind, in Virginia sports. Uh, Brandon Elliott, the two-time national championship coach for Virginia Wesleyan softball. Uh, he's also a pretty good follow on social media. So you can find him on Twitter at Elliott Says What. Uh, coach? Thanks for joining us today. I know this is a very tricky time, particularly leading a Division Three program here in Virginia. Absolutely, and I appreciate you guys having me. Uh, Virginia born and raised, so anything I can do uh, across the state's huge for us. We'd love to hear that. You know, a couple things, as I mentioned, this is on Facebook Live, so anybody watching, if you have a question for Coach, uh, please feel free to ask. We'll try to get that up. Uh, and also, this video will be available on our Facebook page, at VA Sports HOF. Uh, following uh, this interview. So once we're done, you'll be able to access it that way too. But I guess, Coach, first things first, obviously the decision came down. You guys just started your season a few weeks in. What was your initial reaction and where did you, how did you find out about the decision to cancel spring sports? Well, to be honest with you, it was a kind of interesting week for us. Um, we had decided uh, about uh, eight months ago that we were going to try to go crazy with this, uh, this senior class that we had and we're going to make a crazy, crazy trip. And so we, as, and I say we, families, players, uh, coaching staff, administration decided we we're going to take a spring break trip this year to Hawaii. Um, and you can imagine the, uh, the expenses involved with that and, and the extensive amount of fundraising on top of what we already do. And uh, so that Monday, uh, the decision from the NCAA came down, I believe, on Thursday. Mm -hmm. um, that Monday, um, our administration at Virginia Wesleyan, um, you know, emergency response team uh, contacted me uh, that afternoon. And it was an off day for us and told us that, you know, we needed to cancel our, our spring break trip to Hawaii. Uh, and so I had to deliver the news. I did it in person that evening in the team meeting on Monday. And uh, at that moment, I thought, uh, like I told the girls, I feel like the Grinch. Um, it was the right decision, certainly. Uh, certainly now it looks like definitely the right decision, right? But at that time, that was when things were really starting to kind of begin to move. Um, so I felt like the Grinch on Monday. And then you just can't keep the kids away from social media. I mean, that's what they live and, and go by. And so the reports of conferences canceling, I believe the Ivy League, and then you start seeing some Division One conferences scheduled. So it was kind of on everybody's hearts and minds. And um, we we practiced. Uh, I gave them a couple of days off, and then we practiced. Uh, actually, practiced on that Thursday, uh, and um, you know we just did actually let them play slow pitch. We just kind of hung out because uh, I mean no, nobody was focused, and we were in limbo. We didn't have a game for I think 16 days at that point. Um, and then uh, at the end of practice, some girls saw it on their cell phone and and had some questions and. You know, well, for us, I mean, that wasn't at that point wasn't the end of the season. We still had the conference uh, potential conference season to play and seeing what our conference and our university was going to do. But, you know, for us and I mean, you, you, the, the folks that are in the Virginia Sports Hall of Fame, they know, I mean, for us is to try to compete and, and win a national championship and compete at a high level. So to know that the championships were over. Um, we had that conversation um, there uh, in, in the dugout and together, and it was certainly emotional. Uh, we still had a little bit of hope at the season, but, um, you know, fortunately we were able to be together, but uh, certainly the most difficult conversation I've, I've ever had to have with, uh, with a group of people you care, care genuinely a lot about. Well, you know, you, and you mentioned the championships. I mean, that's not something that is, uh, that, that's unique to you guys. You guys have had a, 
an unprecedented run of success in the 12 years. I guess you're, this would be your 13th season as coach, right? right. So eight NCAA appearances, seven consecutive, seven ODAC championships. I mentioned the the two time the two the two national champions championships. Uh, and this, I'm assuming this group was probably on that trajectory as well. I mean, talk about the, I guess, the disappointment or just like the what could have been that goes into to these decisions and those conversations that you had to have with your student athletes. Yeah, I mean, I just got chills thinking about it. I mean, in the grand scheme of things, right at that moment, we thought it was one of the most difficult things in our life. But what we're dealing with globally right now, you know, I, I keep trying to tell our kids, you know, there's a billion people out there that doesn't that don't know what Virginia Wesleyan or, or Division three softball is. So. Uh, in the grand, but they know what coronavirus is right now. Um, mm -hmm. So I try to keep it in perspective a little bit. But in that moment, I mean, you certainly think are the what ifs. And, um, you know, I, I could do this thing for another 20 years, 25 years. And I hope that I have the opportunity to do that. And we may never have the opportunity to compete for a conference championship, much less a national championship. So when you know you're in the midst of um, a great year and I know how difficult it is, and, and maybe it wouldn't have ended on a national run, but I, I hope it would have. Um, but where we were, how we were playing, the group of women that we have, um, we certainly felt like we were in the mix to make another big run, um, <clears throat> especially with that senior class that have won it twice already. Uh, so that, you know, that makes it, you know, I asked the girls, I said, if we weren't any good, would it be easier to have this decision? Like if we were terrible, <laughs> um, one of the, the coolest thing that came out of that um, was one of our kids said, coach, it doesn't matter how good we are that makes us hard. It matters how much we care about each other. And I, I think that was like the, the big piece for me it was they weren't as concerned about the season being over as they were with knowing that they probably weren't going to be together. Um, you know, and that's what culture is all about in sports, right? Well, you, you talk about that culture and, you know, we did an exhibit with you guys uh, about a year ago where we highlighted one of your national championship teams. And the one thing I remember that really stuck out to me when we kind of did that little reception of where the exhibit was in town center is the camaraderie of that team. And, and just you mentioned culture. I think looking from outside that the camaraderie that you've been able to kind of foster uh, in your program is second to none. How has that helped everybody get through this process? You know, certainly it's, it's funny you mention that because after that, you know, going into the season last year, you know, we were 42 and six. We had a phenomenal year last year, um, you know, made another run at a national championship and, you know, fell short in the regionals. Um, but the, the thing that a lot of people don't know is on the inside there, we were we were bubbling. Uh, we were really struggling uh, culture wise and um, based compared to where it had been in the past. And, um, you know, a lot of reasons, I mean, we'd gotten a new facility, which was great, but we didn't have, a, we didn't have anywhere to practice in the fall. So we were trying to piece some things together. We weren't in a rhythm. The facility was being built while we were practicing. We had nine freshmen from five different States. You know, I'm sure as a head coach, I didn't handle things great all the time either. So, you know, last year was a struggle mentally with, with that group. Um, and, you know, what happened was we had some conversations uh, this summer. Um, I actually had phone calls with every returning player and I put myself on mute, which is difficult. Um, but I just let them have at it. You know, what's working? What's not working? What do we need to change culturally? What do we need to do? Um, and the things that came out of those conversation um, with those women were, you know, sometimes they were tough to hear, um, you know, because some of it was on me, but some of it was on them and, and just some things we needed to do. And we changed a lot of things. And I say we. The women approach things differently. The coaches did, practice did. Uh, and the culture, uh, our word this year was revive. Um, and that was just bring new energy or new life into. And that's what this group of women did. Uh, and culturally this year, um, you know, I would say would rival that 17 and 18 team. Um, those two teams were just so close and so much love. You know, our hashtag is out love. And this group did it again. Um, and, you know, you said, you know, how am I doing that with the culture? Uh, I just think I'm a small piece of it, to be honest with you. Um, the years that our culture and our team have come so close together, maybe we put a challenge out. We have a, a leadership coach. His name is Bob Groves. Um, he is phenomenal. He comes in every now and then, and, and he'll even tell you the reception that he gets from the women and the things that they do together. Um, instead of me mandating it or leading it, it's like I'm a part of it. Um, and I, and I'm, I'm lucky they let me be a part of it, but, and I genuinely say that the, the women build the culture and, um, it, it, that's, I think what's, it's making this so tough is, is not being able to be with them. Well, and you know, when you, when you have a team like yours and the culture that, that gets built, obviously it's upperclassmen heavy, or it, that's, that's just kind of the nature of the business. So now you're looking at 
seniors who may not be able to come back next year. I know the NCAA, I believe, is voting today on, on what mm -hmm. to do with eligibility for spring and winter sports. And I don't want to put you in a position to, to go viral or anything, but what should be considered when that decision is being made? You know, I was super surprised that they came out um, across the board and let eligibility go across the board. Um, and I think from for the average sports fan, I don't think we and even myself, you know, I don't understand the Division One scholarships. But there's a lot of things that need to be considered. Um, how is that going to affect the incoming freshmen? How is that going to affect scholarships if we continue each year? You're going to have another an extra class of scholarships. You know, what does that look like? Certainly for an SEC school. You know, it's not going to affect an Alabama or an Auburn, but what is that going to do to a smaller school like Old Dominion? What is that going to do to a school in the MEAC like Norfolk State? That you know, What is it going to do to those groups that are fundraising for their scholarships? Now they got to fundraise for an additional year, you know, so that might affect kids as certain. There goes the dogs. That might affect. Uh, we are live. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, it's not my kid, I promise. Uh, that <laughs> might affect people in different ways. Um, certainly the Division three aspect. Um, are these student athletes going to come back for a full year and pay full financial aid to come back and play a year um, of sports? And, you know, maybe some of them do, but it, you know, I, George Ware is from Central College, you know, and, and I talked to him. I've talked to Patrick Murphy at Alabama. You know, both of them said, you know, there's not a decision that's going to work for everybody. Um, so I would be surprised if the NCAA goes completely back on what they said, because I think that's going to ignite a, a huge issue. Um, there's been some conversation that there's support that potentially it could be just for seniors. Um, we're going to see how it goes. My personal opinion is that I think whatever we do, um, that we at least give the players, give the kids that have lost this year, give them the opportunity to make the decision. Um, what opportunities that looks like, what the rules look like and how it unfolds. It's not going to work for everybody like those other men have said, but at least we give them the opportunity to make the decision and they can take advantage of it or not. So the games are canceled. We know that, but you still, your job is still to be the head coach of the Virginia Wesleyan softball program, but you're doing it remotely. You know, what, what are we, the challenges? I'm sure we could probably go through and list them, but I want to hear from you. Like what are the challenges of running a program remotely and how do you keep your team together? How do you recruit? You know, how do you stay relevant? Because even even at the D3 level, there's competition for players. There's competition for just time and just being noticed. So, so what are you doing to make sure that you're running a program correctly from a remote position? Well, I think you uh, from the recruiting standpoint, you've got to stand out. You've got to be you've got to be different. Um, you've got to be different in what other people are doing. And, and certainly for us, it's being a little goofy and having a presence on social media. Um, that's what the, the, the young kids want and, and opening that up. Um, you know, I'm not a big FaceTime guy with recruiting. I'm a phone call guy, but we're starting to open up like, hey, let's have some FaceTime conversations with your family. Because now we're actually in a situation where we've got mom and dad and everybody's home. Um, so I've got some calls at night uh, with some of our recruits um, in the future and, and obviously maintaining the recruits that we have commitments from and trying to do some a little bit more interaction there. Um, as far as running our program, you know, I told our kids, I sent them a video. Um, you know, emotional video to thank them for everything they've done this season. But what we've done is the challenge of, all right, our, our, the three pillars of our program are tradition, excellence, and humility. And so the challenge for our kids is how can we operate within those pillars of our program remotely? And so we've actually split into three groups. There's a tradition, an excellence, and a humility group. Um, those groups are planning what that looks like for the rest of the semester. Under excellence, you could see um, our workouts Monday, Wednesday, Friday going to be player led they may go in small groups and, and work out together on FaceTime at home doing body weight stuff we're not going to the gym certainly but um, that way they can hold each other accountable uh, accountable um, we have some kids that are checking in with some other kids on the academic piece that falls under excellence um, tradition we have team dinners we have team meetings we have team prayer time Sundays we do a family prayer group uh, on zoom and parents are welcome to it it's, it's actually led by a player every year every week and that's been super powerful uh, team dinners, um, you know, we're doing, you know, team dinner or lunch. Maybe we do a Zoom meeting, just the outfielders, just the infielders. Um, that can fall under our tradition. And the humility piece, um, you may have seen, we've, we've adopted a young lady through Friends of Jacqueline who has terminal brain cancer, Mia, uh, her brother Brendan, and her mother Michelle. Um, and so making sure that we're still staying connected with them. We, we certainly don't can't visit them right now, but social media stuff, um, sending them videos, writing them letters, doing any of that stuff. Uh, working with my wife's class. Uh, she's a second grade teacher and 
we have some pen pals there that we're doing and, and emailing our professors. So trying to be creative as much as we can. Um, and then from a leader's position, from my side of things, uh, Monday through Thursday from nine to 10, I have individual FaceTime conversations uh, with, um, with players every day. So we're big about relationships. I'm huge in relationships with our kids. I want to see their face. Um, some of the conversation is about what's going on at home. Um, some of it's academically, some of it's just to check in, uh, have some FaceTime with them literally. Um, and just trying to stay connected. Um, so we're doing the best we can. I'm, I'm doing a lot of stuff on social media through our association and Q and A's and trying to, trying to learn too. But, um, on a personal side, like you, you know, also taking advantage of being home yeah. in March and April, uh, you know, I have an eight-year-old son and uh, you heard my dogs and yard of the month right now, baby. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm working to that point. We're, we're still well behind. <laughs> 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 but, you know, in, in talking about that, as I mentioned, you're, you're actually a pretty entertaining Twitter follow. At Elliot says what, I'll say that again. But this is something that you've been doing. You're not doing this as a result of, of the coronavirus. Does that put somebody like you and your program in a better position as opposed to somebody who that's just not a part of their, their style? And now they're kind of forced into that. Well, I think it depends on the type of kids that you're going to attract too, right? So certainly me being goofy and doing things on social media might not work for some kids. And that's fine. That's okay. Um, but but I think it gives a presence. Uh, you know, I'm pushing 40. So it gives a presence for me to feel like I'm 18 again. Uh, but I think it gives a, a presence for us uh, about we, we do have fun in our program. Um, and, and, you know, anytime that you're attracting viewers and tweets and retweets and things like that, I mean, if it if it's a good thing, it helps get your program out there a little bit. And uh, and maybe finds us a kid or two that maybe is interested. So certainly uh, we're going to take advantage of that as best we can um, and try to put some out uh, on, our, on our team page as well. So let's talk about the program. As I mentioned, uh, very successful program over the last 12 years, uh, two national titles, seven conference championships. Uh, did, did you see, was this your plan? I mean, obviously everybody says, yes, we're, we want to win national titles. But when you took over 12 years ago, did you see this level of success coming and being a, con a consistent top level division three program? Yeah, to be honest with you, I talked about Bob Groves, our leadership guy. He's been a big mentor in my life uh, for a long time, uh, you know, pastor my church forever. And, and he always talks about uh, when I speak to groups, he always talks about BHAGs uh, and he says big, hairy, audacious goals. And he always tells me, you know, it's like, what is your BHAG? You know, what, what does that look like? Like, give me your goals, your attainable goals. He's like, but give me that crazy, stupid, big, hairy goal that nobody thinks. And when we took over the program, you know, it was part time. You know, it was a $7,000 stipend. And I, was, I quit my teaching I saw that job. on Twitter. I saw that on Twitter the other day. It was, it was, it was bonkers. <laughs> and, you know, we were newly married. I mean, and, and, and part of you is like, what the heck? Why did you do that? Um, and now you're like, well, now it makes sense. Um, but I think the BHAG back then was, you know, we at that time, we wanted to get, you know, they haven't been to a regional in 26 years. And it was like, we want to get to a regional. We want to compete nationally. And I was bullheaded and 26 and could do no wrong. And it was like, we're going to win the whole thing. Uh, I'm not even sure I believe that, but I said it. Uh, and, uh, you know, I said it in recruiting and did that kind of stuff. And then I think as you got through the processes and, you know, you got into the conference championship and then you came back the next year and you thought we were really, really good. And then you got a little bit higher nationally and then you got slapped around by some really good programs. And then we got a little bit to the regional and then we got slapped around again. And uh, eventually we got to a point where we're like, hey, man, we're, we're pretty good. I think we can do that. Um, I think it was probably about 2013 when we really realized at a national level we could really get after it. Um, you know, the dream and the goal was to win a national championship. I know how crazy um, that is and how difficult that is. And to do it twice was unbelievable. Um, and we've been super blessed. But, you know, I would say that was uh, that was our BHAG. Uh, how much I believed in it, I'd have to go back to that 26-year-old guy. And I'm probably sure I would like to strangle that guy sometimes. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> But yeah, ultimately the goal, you know, to, to do that. And, and now that's the goal every year, um, you know, and Dave Macedo and our men's basketball team and then our women's soccer team that did it that next fall, you know, uh, our men's basketball team won it in 2006. And that let Virginia Wesleyan know like, Hey man, like we can do this. Uh, women's soccer went to the final four uh, that fall in 2006 with Jeff Bowers leading that program. And um, I was able to be a, a part of that and watch those teams. And, and when I took over this program, I was like, we want to be like them. Um, and, uh, you know, those are two great mentors and two programs we emulated at Virginia Wesleyan. Sorry, if you hear some banging, there's some construction going on. Nah, you're, you're good, man. <laughs> Again, good live, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you mentioned a couple of, the, of your, uh, your colleagues at Virginia Wesleyan. 
how much, I guess, information sharing is going on right now? Because you all are navigating this together. And you're, you know, while your responsibility is to the softball program, you're an ambassador for the university. And you all want to make sure that everybody's going to be set up in a great position once we can get back on the court and on the field. So how much information sharing is going on between you and your colleagues? I think more of it's been uh, sending gifts and, uh, and memes uh, to make each other laugh. <laughs> That's fun too. <laughs> uh, we're, we're, uh, we're an interesting group of coaches. Uh, a lot of, uh, unusually, we have a, uh, not a lot of Division three schools have a lot of uh, tenured coaches as we do. So, um, but I'll tell you that, I mean, it hasn't been a ton of information because I think we're all trying to look, see what this looks like um, from afar and working from home. Um, we're interactive people as coaches are, so we don't text and call a lot. We're in person. Um, so it's been different. And a lot of our coaches, almost all of our coaches have families of their own and, and multiple children and young children. And um, I think everybody's trying to figure out what that looks like at home right now, uh, taking care of our teams. But uh, but we're, we're supposed to have some department meetings coming up, and I think you're going to see some ideas bounce off each other. Uh, and, you know, Coach Francis, baseball coach, is one of my best friends. So him and I are doing, some, we're looking to do some FaceTime dates with our wives to do something. So uh, we're all, we're all starting to itch, but the, the yard work for coaches has uh, finally been taken care of. So all of our families are excited about that. <laughs> well, you've, you've seen how, how you've seen how to do it right on the fields that you play. So you might as well carry that over to your personal life, right? Our grounds crew has done a good job taking care of our <laughs> fields. So uh, now I'm taking care of the yard. I got to get in trouble. I can't put pictures out. They'll expect me to do it at work. <laughs> yeah, you mentioned the baseball coach. You you played baseball at Wesley, and then you were an assistant coach, and then you made the transition to uh, to the softball team. What went into that decision? Well, you know, Nick Booth, a longtime coach at Virginia Wesleyan, um, you know, gave me the opportunity when I was done playing to uh, to coach and be a part of that staff as a volunteer. Uh, and then I was working with, uh, I was talking, having some conversation with uh, Gary Spedden is at Grassfield. He was at Ocean Lakes. He was my high school coach, uh, and even St. Clair Jones. It's at Kellum who played at Wesleyan um, about getting in. Uh, getting into the high school ranks. I want to be a high school baseball coach. Um, and I was getting interviews and not getting jobs. I was, again, I was 25 or 26 getting frustrated. Uh, but Nick gave me the opportunity, you know, to continue at the college level. Um, but I, I just, I wanted to be a head coach eventually. And, and uh, the, the position at Wesleyan opened up. Um, they had a resignation with about eight games left in the season in 07. The athletic director at the time, Sonny Travis said, Hey, uh, can you come over and finish this thing up for two weeks? And Sure. I mean, it was 15 bucks an hour, man. It was, it was, uh, it was, oh, spring, it was a lot of money. <laughs> it was, it was, uh, it was spring break during that time and I was teaching. So I did it for, for two weeks and I kind of fell in love with being around, uh, the group of kids and, and the challenge of that. And, uh, and that summertime, the school came and said, Hey, listen, um, what do you think we should do with this position? And I said, well, I think you need to make it full time and you need to hire a female. And they said, well, you're not interested. And I was like, no, 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 male. You need to hire a guy. Um, but I mean, that was my honest belief at that time. So, you know, they, uh, they offered me the job, uh, full time. I think it was a $7,700 stipend at 10 bucks an hour. And what do you think? And so I came home and my wife and I talked about it and prayed about it and decided to quit my, quit my job teaching elementary school, um, uh, Landworks Unlimited in Chesapeake and Jeff Miller and their family hired me to 10 bucks an hour to, to be a landscaper from six 30 to two 30. And then I'd drive to practice and Eventually, Virginia Wesleyan was able to make it full time and it's turned into uh, with other duties. Now, Dr. Miller's made it a job where I just get to coach softball and um, it's, it's, uh, it's been a blessing, but it's been a long journey, uh, yeah. a long journey. And a lot of people, uh, a lot of people on the way that have that have helped help me and the, and the women in our program for sure. Well, now you can take that landscaping experience and apply it to your yard. No doubt. I'm mad. I actually sent Jeff a message and I said, hey, man, I'm sick of moving uh, River Rock. I was like, but uh, I would repair some irrigation and a mulch. I'm like, this is awful. <laughs> Why would anybody do this for a living? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, we, we only got a few more questions for you. We'll get you out of here. I know that time is precious and everything, but when you look at this situation and at the end of it, we've been presented with a lemon, probably a big basket of lemons. How are you going to make lemonade out of this situation? You know, uh, my parents always talk about knowing their neighbors and getting around and doing that kind of stuff. And I, and I, I don't think we as a society – we do a good job of that. You know, we go to work, we come home, we do social media, we stay with our families, everything's right there. And, um, you know, I'm fortunate to live in a phenomenal neighborhood and um, with a lot of really close uh, neighbors. And, you know, like last night, I mean, we did a social hour, uh, everybody on their driveway. Um, and, you know, there's eight families out there and we're all, you know, 30, 40 feet apart, but we had more conversation last year than we did. My wife and I are FaceTiming somebody different every day, um, a family or a friend. And, 
um, writing letters and uh, seeing people care for each other. And, you know, maybe this is a thing. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Christian man. I'm a God-fearing man. And maybe this is a way that uh, the big dog upstairs is telling us to slow down. Um, you know, I've spent more time at home in the last two and a half, three weeks with my family than I ever have in the month of March and April. And um, we just keep saying, let's make this a memorable situation for our son when he thinks, hey, when he's 40 and he's like, oh, coronavirus, I got to hang out with my dad and we did chalk walk and, you know, we made a planter box and we planted vegetables or whatever it is. Um, and I think that's uh, that's that's the challenge there. And we're certainly concerned about finances. We're concerned about the economy. We're concerned about people's health. Uh, and it's scary, um, but it goes back to our program without love. You know, if we can find ways just to love on people and you're seeing that, you know, what, what, what you guys are seeing with, with Wavy 10 and your wife and what they're doing out there and what these schools are doing and teachers and, and our healthcare workers. I mean, unbelievable. Uh, we're finding ways that, that it, to, to remember how much we actually care about human beings. Um, and I think that that's, that's really, I think at the end of it, we'll be able to take in, in an, unfortunately a situation like this, is making us appreciate our health um, because it's a scary time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and we've seen it in the past. You know, at big, big tragic situations are typically when people come closest together. Now, it's how do you maintain that the further you get away from that? Um, and, and hopefully that this uh, these next three months, you know, with the kids at home, particularly here in Virginia, since schools are closed, hopefully that family time does kind of teach everybody a little something. Um, you know, that that's a hope, and hopefully it's something we can do uh, outside of your own sports your own team, is there a sporting event that you are just gutted that you cannot see now? Well, I'm, I'm a big baseball guy. MLB TV certainly took my yearly <laughs> membership out of my credit card statement the other day. Uh, you might want to ask this, for that back. <laughs> uh, I'm going to ask, we're going to have some sort of credit here. Um, you know, certainly, uh, you know, I, I miss that, I miss that opportunity to watch baseball, um, you know, on my phone and, and on the road and things like that. Uh, you know, baseball has been a big part of my life. You know, everybody misses March Madness right now. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm a, I'm a big uh, UVA fan, and, and uh, you know, it's been difficult to watch. And, um, you know, I'll be selfish. You, you took it away from me, but the Women's Cup World Series, uh, if you haven't had a chance to watch that or people don't, I mean, it's just phenomenal what those women do on TV. And um, But, you know, we tell our athletes all the time, going back to your former question, that it, you know, what's one thing we take out of it? We tell everybody in our whole career, and I know you were an athlete, is, you know, play every game like it's your last. Practice like it's your last. Well, we have now a sector of people that are able to say like, you have to take it like it's your last because I actually had it taken away from me. Um, and so maybe that's a lesson to, to appreciate some things too. That, that's a great approach. I mean, you, you have to take, you can't change what's going on. So nope. you have to figure out how can you make it better for the next people coming up. Uh, one final question, and this is probably the hardest question you will ever face, but being in the dugout, being around baseball, obviously a lot of hot dogs get eaten. <laughs> Is a hot dog a sandwich? That's that's the question that's on everybody's mind these days. No, no. exactly. Thank you. No, but Thank if you, you were a hot dog, would you eat yourself? Well, according to Harry <laughs> Carey, yes. <laughs> well, Will Ferrell is Harry Carey. <laughs> oh man, well, Brandon, I'm glad we were able to get some laughs in. Uh, good to learn about the program. Hopefully, more people will learn about the program through this video. Again, this will be up on our Facebook page. Uh, we appreciate the people that did tune in to watch. I think we got up to about. 15, 20 at one point. Apparently my questions were good enough because nobody wanted to ask. Them. <laughs> hey, that's 15 more than I thought. So. <laughs> that's right. Uh, well, I'd like to thank, I'd like to thank Brandon uh, from Virginia Wesleyan softball. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, stay safe, stay healthy and, uh, and wish you guys the best in the future. Yeah. Hope you and your family stay healthy as well, man. Thanks, Absolutely. Will. You can follow Brandon at Elliot says what on Twitter. You can follow the softball program at VWU softball. Uh, continue to thank, go out to all of our partners at the Hall of Fame, Priority Automotive, City of Virginia Beach, Optimum Health, ESPN Radio. If you like what you saw, follow all of our uh, social media handles, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, at VA Sports HOF. I am Will Driscoll from the Virginia Sports Hall of Fame. I hope everyone has a great day. Please stay safe and stay healthy. We'll talk to you soon. Good? Yep. We're good, man.